Hello, and welcome to Applied Imagery's Getting Started series. This multi-part series is designed to get users proficient in the tools and capabilities available within the Quick Terrain Modeler software. This chapter covers the various methods of opening data, as well as useful settings to customize and share your QT Modeler profiles. Let's get started by looking at the various ways to load data into QT Modeler. I'm going to open up Windows Explorer and navigate to my geospatial data, and simply drag the file into the QT Modeler. Another way to open up data is to go to the Add Model button, navigate to where your data is, select a file, and you'll notice a metadata viewer down here at the bottom. And we can go ahead and click Open as well. A third way to load in data is utilizing the Find Model tool. I'm going to hover my mouse over the edge of the two files that are loaded and click the F key, and then it opens up the Model Search tool. It pre-populates with the cursor coordinate you enter in which directory or cache file you want to search, what kind of data you want to find, and any kind of search radius, and click Find Data. You can see it found four files. I'm going to select these four files and click Load Data. Note that you can also access the Model Search tool simply by clicking on the binoculars button. So if you don't have any data loaded already, you simply open up this tool and you can manually enter in the coordinates based on a number of different coordinate systems listed above. And a fourth way to load data into QT Modeler is using the import function, import, import model data. This gives you a lot more flexibility on what kind of data formats can be imported into what sort of model format. You can select your files, and it has options to merge your data, to resample as needed. You have options for your gridding algorithms used, any kind of filtering you might want to do upon import, as well as relabeling the coordinate systems. This is a great way, if you already know your data, to go directly from a raw point cloud to something like a bare earth dem model. There's also three new toolkits that were designed directly to help you load data into QT Modeler. They are the point cloud toolkit, the dem toolkit, and the QT Explorer. Let's take a look at the point cloud toolkit first. The Point Cloud Toolkit can point to a collection of point clouds. I'm going to select a bunch of point clouds here, click on Open. And you can see their thumbnails visualized here in the Web Mapping Service overlay. I can interact with this Web Mapping Service by using my scroll wheel to zoom in and out, and right click to pan, and I can find areas of interest here within the Point Cloud thumbnails. I can use the Area of Interest tools to select a subset, and I can use these variables above to filter the data, to resample, to merge them as a group, or keep them separate. This is a great way to interact with very large point cloud data sets. The Dem Customization Toolkit, this button here, does very much the same thing, although it was designed to work with surface model data as opposed to point clouds. And finally, the QT Explorer tool. This tool was designed to work with very large stack-based data sets. Stack stands for spatio-temporal asset catalogs, and are generally server-based repositories of again very large data sets. I'm going to start by looking at the Microsoft Planetary Computer. It pre-populates to the area based on what data is lo already loaded into QT Modeler, but I can also override that by using these buttons down here. I'm going to click Find Collections, and here we have a list of collections that were found from the Microsoft Planetary Computer. I'm going to scroll down to the USGS Point Clouds, Click on Find Items. And you'll see that there are no items in this particular area. So I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. I'm going to go back to my AOI. And I'm going to set the AOI based on my current map extents. And Find Again. Check my Point Cloud folder. And click Find Items. This time we were zoomed out far enough that it found a few files from another collection. I'm going to select an individual file and go ahead and click Load Selected Item. It looks like the data from the Microsoft Planetary Computer is in a slightly different coordinate system than the data I already have loaded into QT. QT recognized that and is prompting me to convert to the current data set. I'm going to go ahead and click Go. And now it's unpacking the downloaded last file and converting the coordinate system and loading directly into the scene. 
I can close this window. I'll zoom into my new data set. And because it's in a different area, the height scale is a little bit discolored. So I'm going to click on the Z key on my keyboard, which re-ramps the color based on my current view extent. And now you can see this is a great way to merge online based repositories and stack format with your current holdings. We can remove data by right clicking the file in the layer tree and clicking remove. I'm going to go back to my full data extent by clicking on the reset view. Again, my color ramp is a little distorted. I'm going to hold down the control Z, which undoes that re-ramping that I just previously did. Let's go ahead and overlay some imagery. You can also drag and drop imagery if you already have it on disk, or you can click on the import WMS imagery button. There's a number of different sources to choose from. Click on retrieve. And now we have our imagery downloaded. Click accept, and I can close this window. Another way to work with data here is I can right click a file and I can convert my model type. And this is going to convert my point cloud into a surface model. I have my new format cho chosen as a QTT gridded service. I can change my grid sampling, which is my pixel size. I have options that I can set for the interpolation algorithms and click convert. And now that's done, I can turn off my point cloud and I can see that I have a gridded surface model as well. Nothing stops you from looking at point clouds and surface models together. But there are some important differences between the two. So for display settings, let's turn on our point clouds and click on our configure point size button. Here's where we can define how large or small each individual point is drawn on the screen. This helps when you have various resolutions and density data sets loaded. So if ever you're looking at your data and it looks a little, a little muddied or not quite as high resolution as you would have expected, you can just dial down that point cloud size. Similarly, if you're looking at an area and it looks very sparse, you can go ahead and make those point size a little bit larger and it kind of fills in the gaps a little bit. But the point size algorithms don't have an effect at all on the surface models. So let's load in the surface models, turn off our point clouds, and what has the biggest effect on how a surface model looks is our lighting. So you can hold down the control key, left click, and move your mouse. And this is how we can define where the artificial sun is lit from. We can also click on the light bulb button. And you can set that artificial sun to a specific date and time. cast shadows from them. As well as create multi-directional hill shades where we can add additional artificial light sources. Another nice display tool is the x-ray tool. I'm going to go ahead and click on our x-ray button. And what this does is it breaks down the image into two separate parts. You have the exterior content and what we call the x-ray insert. You can change the size as well as what's being drawn in each of these two windows. You can also access a lot of the display and control settings up here in the display menu as well as accessing some common ones over here in the special overlay section. For example, I can turn on my legend. And you'll notice the legend is turned on on the left-hand side. Note that most of these options can be left-clicked and or right-clicked. So if I right-click my legend, I can set a background, and it makes it a little bit more obvious popping off the screen. The height colors that you're looking at can be toggled on and off by clicking on the toggle height color button, and can be customized by right-clicking that same button, where you can import different palettes to be used from outside sources, or customize your own within Qt Modeler. All these various settings that we've been talking about get stored into something called profiles. And profiles can be shared by going to File, Options and Settings, Save and Load Profiles. There's also a few pre-made profiles that you can take a look at. 
And finally, by now, you're probably used to the navigation in Qt Modeler. The scroll wheel zooms you in and out of your data. The right mouse button will pan, and your left mouse button does the rotation. You can change these by going to the control menu, control mode, and we have a few other control styles to choose from, as well as inverting the scroll wheel by unselecting the Google Earth style zoom. Another nice trick with a hotkey is to hold down the control key, hover your mouse over an object, such as that bridge in the top right corner, and use your scroll wheel to zoom you directly into that bridge. So as long as you're holding down the control key on your keyboard, your scroll wheel will zoom you into your cursor location. There's many other hotkeys and shortcuts that you can take a look at by going to the help menu, hotkeys and shortcuts. There's also our full help menu is accessible here as well, and some reference guides to help. If you have any questions or feedback about the content of this chapter or any other topics in the Quick Terrain Modeler, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you.